All right. Welcome back to a new edition to Queen, of Queen City Reds. We're back to you after missing a couple of weeks. I was at the Reds game two weeks ago. Uh, I was traveling last week, so long overdue. We have lots to talk about today. Paul, how are you doing today? Pretty good. Pretty good. Thanks for having me, Greg. Absolutely. Well, let's first get things started with the trade deadline talk. Obviously, that was about a week ago. Um, now, I was in Chicago at the time, sitting there. Reds were playing pretty decent against the Cubs. I was hoping, you know, Reds would make a couple moves, whether they sell, whether they buy. It turns out Reds traded Frankie Montes to the Brewers, traded Lucas Sims to the Red Sox. Um, they got some. They got Joey Weimer in return. They got um, Jacob Junis in return for Frankie Montes. And they got um, a young kid who's in low A, um, for Lucas Sims, he's still only, I think, like 19 years old. Um, but just what are your thoughts um, on the Reds trade deadline? Were you happy? Would you like to have seen him do more? Um, just overall, what were your thoughts on the Reds trade deadline um, last week? Yeah, um, you know, I we had talked before our last time and said, you know, not really sure what they would do. But I think doing something here is better than nothing, especially like I look at the Sims trade and that is – a good trade in my opinion because they traded a guy that has been struggling a little bit hasn't doesn't really seem to be he's going to be fitting with them for the future necessarily and they got a young prospect out of it so I think getting anything for him was huge especially a young guy like that I think he was like 29th on the Red Sox uh, prospect list um, so I think that one's good um, and we had talked about the uh, Montas trade over text and you know initially i was a little upset because of the brewers and you made a good point it's like why not get the best guy best available no matter who you're trading to whether that's in division or not and i think you know trading in division yeah sure that's that's hard to watch when you see you know if we're going to watch montas or have face against montas but they did what they needed to do they got rid of a starting pitcher which they have had pretty good starting pitching this year and ample of it and they got two guys that are going to be able to impact the team. So I think they are at least trying. Um, as far as doing more, sure, I would have loved to see more, but I have no idea what that would be, you know. <laughs> like, they're yeah. not going to get, like, Shohei Otani or something. So, or without get, you know, they're not going to get somebody big without giving up somebody that I don't want them to give up. So I was pretty happy with it. I wasn't really expecting a lot. Um What'd you yeah, think? no, I think you. Yeah, I think you make a couple good points. I mean, the biggest thing for me is they got rid of two guys on expiring deals, pretty much. I mean, Montes, mm -hmm. I think had a mutual option or player option yeah. um, that most likely wasn't going to get uh, picked up. I, if it was a player option, maybe it would have got picked up because I mean, you're talking about a guy with a five ERA, um, and to 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 get a guy back like Joey Weimer, he was the Brewers' number three prospect last year. Um, he struggled when he came up hitting it's, it's all going to be about hitting for him. Um, he's a great defender. He's pretty fast. Um, if he can hit average, he'll, he'll be a pretty solid center fielder. I think, um, now he's really struggled to hit right-handed pitching. I think, um, he's, he's had a swing change. I think he's going through in the minors. Um, now he's up with the reds, obviously, because Benson is, um, on paternity leave, but I like it. I mean, you're, you're, you're giving up a guy with a five ERA, on an ex on a deal on that you're probably not going to have next year. And if you want him back, you could go sign him back. Um, and you're getting a guy who has some upside because he was the third prospect in the organization. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. You also got Jacob Junis in that deal. Who's a solid reliever and he can give you some innings. And I don't have a lot of strong thoughts about Jacob Junis, but he's had a pretty solid year. And I think it's a pretty good return for Montes, which is why I said what I said to you. Like if, if the Brewers are offering the best return, I mean, if Joey Weimer amounts to anything, you have right. basically five or six years of Joey Weimer for a half a year of five ERA Frankie Montas. It's a pretty good right. deal. And then Sims, like, is there, there's probably a pretty good chance we never see the guy that Lucas Sims is traded yeah. for. Um, he's such a young kid, but when you're trading a, a reliever on an expiring deal, who's not going to be back next year, if you ju you're just taking flyers and the Reds have right. plenty of bullpen depth. Um, if anything, I think when it comes to doing more, I would have right to re see the Reds get rid of more relievers um, yeah. because they have guys like Zulueta and Zach Maxwell and Brooks Krisky. And there's just a ton of guys that 
are ready to come up that haven't come up yet. So I think if you could get anything from them, do it. Um, now that being said, maybe there wasn't a big market for guys like Justin Wilson or Buck Farmer or the other expiring deals. Um, so I don't necessarily say just get rid of them to get rid of them. Um, but overall, I think, I think it was fine. I think probably I would have liked for them to make a couple more deals to get rid of relievers uh, that aren't going to be here. Just I'm a big believer in if you're out of the race, which I guess technically they weren't at the time. Seems like they are now. Um, I'm a big believer. If you're, if you're not going to resign somebody, at least go get something for them. Um, yeah. You never know what might happen. I mean, the Reds, the Hector Rodriguez, who the Reds traded for Tyler Naquin is a top 15 prospect in their organization now. So like, you just never know what'll happen. I mean, Nick Northcutt, he probably won't play in the majors. He it was traded for, Tommy Pham, he leads double A in home runs, has 23 home runs. Now he's hitting 200. So that doesn't exactly have a lot of success. But again, it's it's a half year Tommy Pham. Like, go, I'm all for the flyers of when you're not really yep. in it. So um, I agree. I don't think, I think I would have loved to see him go get a bat. I don't think that was really probably going to happen uh, with where they were. If they were closer to the race, maybe they would have. But um, it seems like we're pretty much, pretty much on the same page there. Um, coming yeah. from that, the Reds' offense just continues to struggle. Um, they got pretty good pitching in Tampa last week. Somehow they walked out of there with one win. They go and beat the Cubs two out of three, and then you have a perfect you have a perfectly uh, good chance to win two out of three um, against the Giants. Carson Spires pitched pretty well yesterday, and the bullpen kind of imploded. But that was the game. The Reds scored two runs. So right. without yeah. the bullpen imploding, it was just more offensive struggles for the Reds. Um, just, yeah. What are your thoughts on the offense, um, the state of the offense? And it's, yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a hard offense to watch, man. It really is hard to watch. It really is. It's abysmal, you know, um, like even obviously they got no hit that sucks, but you know what? Blake Snell's a great pitcher. So what, you know, but the thing is, is they were, it's not like they're tearing it up besides getting no hit. So it feels like it hurts even more. Um, I'll jump in real quick on the no hitter because I yeah. I buried that under the rug. I kind of, kind of forgot about it because I wasn't even surprised to be honest with you. The first inning when Blake Snell came out, I was like, his stuff is nasty. Like we have no chance. Like we have yeah. no chance, and not no chance because Blake Snell's stuff is that nasty. It's a combination of okay, Blake Snell's stuff is that nasty, and this Reds offense is so bad. Like yeah. it uh, looked the first inning, the Reds batters looked absolutely lost. Yeah. And the most insane thing about that, I was on Chatterbox Reds the other night. They had one hard hit ball. Usually you have no hitters where guys are diving, making right. a crazy catch, or you just run into bad, some bad luck. Santiago Espinal hit the only hard hit ball of the day, and it was a ground out. Like, there was no close – there were no balls yeah. that were like, oh, you got some luck there. He literally just went out and absolutely dominated the Reds for nine innings. Yeah, dominated. It I, Like, it wasn't even hard for him, I don't think. He yeah. struck out, what, 11? And threw 104 walk three and threw 114 pitches over nine innings and probably didn't even break a sweat basically. Like, come on, you know, yeah. it and nothing against Espinal, he's been super hot, he has really has been. But when that, when he is your offense and what you talk about with the offense, you know, it's bad. I, yeah. I know he's been hot, but my gosh, like. Come on. He's he's yeah. the guy we're talking about, you know. But I think I don't know what, what happened this year. You know, a lot of different – you could point out a lot of different things, injuries and all that stuff. But it's been the whole year now, and it sucks. It's really hard to watch when a team's offense sucks. <laughs> yeah, it really it's is. brutal. And you have – you have again, injuries are part of it, but – we all said, wait till TJ Friedel gets back. Okay, Friedel hasn't done much. We said, wait till Noel V. Marte gets back. Noel V. Marte is, we're talking about him later in the show just because he's been so bad. Um, and it's just, Jamie Candelaria has been crazy inconsistent. He had that one hot streak. Other than the really hot streak, he's been not very good. Yeah. We're talking about a team that the Mariners just DFA'd Ty France. Yeah. And the Reds pick him up and say, hey, let's put him in, let's put him in the four spot. We'll put him clean up. Like we're putting a team, we're putting a guy that nobody else wanted 
and putting him for, in the fourth in the lineup. Like that says all you need to know. I get he's had pretty good career numbers, but this year it's been terrible. And we're like, ah, DFA'd right in the four hole. Oh, Santiago yeah. Espinal. Yeah. Throw him in there every day because he's our hottest hitter. Like it's crazy. It's crazy. And there's just not enough, like not, it, there's no more excuse at this point. It is what it is. Like no. Will Benson has not been good. Jake Fraley's hitting for no power. Um, you have Stuart Fairchild. He's hitting lefties okay, sure. Um, Tyler Stevenson's been pretty good. Um, I have a whole – I'm going to go on a rant later about Tyler Stevenson. Spencer Steer's been average. Um, he's been a little above average. He's really good with runners on. Ellie's been awesome. But it's just – it's too many question marks. And it's not right. a deep Especially enough Especially in the outfield. The outfield production is basically nothing. Um, yeah, it's bad. I mean, and like – you get to the point and what, what kills me is like, okay, we've been injuries. We've been injuries, 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 but like the depth is not there. And, no, no. and I'll talk, I want to talk about this a little too, when we talk about how far the reds off later in the show, but it just makes you wonder. And I think it does take time to build that, but it's just frustrating, man. It's just frustrating yeah. to watch. And you have guys that you paid to be here. And then you have guys that, you expect the big things from, and it's just not happening. It's a combination of a bunch of different things. And it just mm -hmm. is what it is. I mean, I think, I think yesterday felt like yesterday felt like the end. Um, I mean, you have four games against the Marlins. You absolutely need a sweep. Um, I, I don't even have faith. They're, they're facing, I think three of the four pitchers are pretty bad. Like guys that are only pitched because the Marlins just traded away their whole team or yeah. guys are hurt like Sandy Alcantara. Um, so yeah, I mean it's yeah. it's brutal. The Reds' offense is uh, just tough to watch. It's night in and night out. Everyone's even yesterday, like they hit back to back home runs, and then it's nothing. Like nothing. that's it. The rest of the game, and it's brutal to watch. But all right, moving on to the offense um, topic, I want to talk about. I'm going to preface this with: I'm a big Fernando Cruz fan. What he did at the beginning of the year was really cool. His story is really cool. So mm -hmm. I don't want this segment to come off. Um, negatively towards Fernando Cruz, the guy. Um, I don't like, you know, crapping on players. Yeah. But, man, we got to stop putting Fernando Cruz in close games. Yeah. Like, he's he has not been good in two months. No. Like, what? It, and, again, we can probably get into this. And this will segue, actually, into the David Bell conversation. I've stood up for David Bell more than half, 90% yeah. of Red's Twitter. <laughs> and, like, I just don't understand how you can be in a must-win game, but it feels like all these games are must-win games. Like, you mm -hmm. you had to manage every game to win. And throw the guy out there that hasn't been good in two months just because he was good for the first two months. Right. Like, we're in it to win the game now. We're not in it to so his confidence is good in October. We're not right. going to be around in October. No. Like, it just it, – it doesn't make any sense to me. When you and those are the things that I I'm the, I'm the king at saying I don't think managers usually matter that much I really don't right. I think it comes down to the players on the field I mean yeah. we just talked about how bad the Reds offense has been I don't think if we have a different manager all those guys are just magically hitting right but the way you can make a difference is things like that don't throw the guy with opponents are hitting three fourteen against him <laughs> since June third three fourteen yeah. and we're putting him in yeah. one run ball games they literally yeah. lost the Rays game because of him. In the offense for two runs, but you were up two nothing in that game. So, like, I just don't understand how you can keep throwing a guy in the same situation. And I do think David Bell is a guy who wants to get guys' confidence back. For sure. Screw guys' confidence. It's freaking August 5th, and you're four or right. five games out, now six. And it's yeah. like, at some point, you have to stop the nonsense and mm -hmm. put guys in there who are going to give you the best chance. I really don't understand it too, because like Sam Mall, for example, has been great this year. Why aren't we like put him in that situation? Any, honestly, really anybody. Santiago's been phenomenal since he's been up. Yes. Like there's a, there's all sorts of guys you can choose. Yeah. Cruz has been legit one of the worst in the pen in the last month or two. Oh yeah, he has. And it's just, yeah, it's just crazy. Like I just and don't understand it. And again, I like Fernando Cruz. His story is awesome. Right, but at some point, can we stop throwing him in one-run games? Like he hasn't given up a run in ten. He's given up runs all the time. He's not. Yeah. He's not the guy who was getting us out of miracles in March and April. And you could you could make an argument and say, well, he was overworked early in the season. Okay, fine. That's fine. If you want to say that, that's fine. That doesn't mean you just keep throwing yeah. him out there. Put him on the put him right. on the injured list. Send him down. I don't know. Do anything, but just Something. keep throwing him out there. 
Like, it's just crazy. It doesn't make any sense. And those are the parts, um, again, that frustrate me with the David Bell situation. Yeah. Um, I, and I'm it just, you, it just doesn't make sense. But yeah, any other, any other thoughts that we didn't talk about on cruise or before we segue into the Bell conversation? No, I was just gonna like, I just had a few stats. Like, since July 1st is like his, so up to July 1st, his K percentage, K per nine was like 16. And since July 1st, it's nine. And his batting average on balls in play up to July 1st was like 309, which is high, but he didn't have a lot of balls in play. But now it's 380. You know, and it's clear. I mean, one eye test, he's not, he's struggling. Stats, he's struggling. Do something about it, you know? Like, yeah, you keep saying, just, you just keep uh, doing the same thing over and over again. Like, what what are we doing? Things don't just get better by keep doing. What do they say? It's insanity when you just keep doing the same thing over and over and expect different results. Yep. Like, it just doesn't make sense. Um, but, yeah, I'm with you. I don't get it. I don't get it. But segueing into that, to the David Bell conversation, again, I've stuck up for the Reds' front office. I've stuck in up to David Bell. The Reds have lost nine Sundays in a row. Nine Sundays in a row. They've lost – their record in getaway days is like 11 and 26 or something like that. Jesus. Like something tells me, like, there's something going on. And yeah. here's where I say that. Like, the Reds – on getaway days, it just so happens that we throw out these lineups to get everybody some rest. Poor yeah. Ellie's the only guy that doesn't get rest on this team. But we keep running him out there. Yeah, but last week we sat him after four days past the All-Star break. We sat him. He needs rest. It was a pre-planned break. Give me a break with a pre-planned break. You just had days off. Game this When it was pre-planned, did you know how it was like a, a big game that you could go for a sweep or right. whatever? Like – or I don't even, it was the first game of the series, whatever it was. I yeah. think the Reds won it, so it didn't matter. But like, I looked, I went back and somebody put, I think it was Reds in four. So shout out to Reds in four on Twitter. The Reds are like, I think it's like 45 and 33 or something like that when Tyler Stevenson starts. Yeah. So I'm going to preface this. this. I'm going to preface this with that doesn't mean if Tyler Stevenson started every day, the Reds would be five right. games above five. <laughs> right. But what I will say is we're talking about how bad this lineup is on a daily basis. Tyler Stevenson doesn't currently qualify because he doesn't have enough at bats, but if he did qualify, he would be second on the team in OPS behind Ellie. So take that. I went and looked up the last nine Sundays and I said, let's see if old Tyler Stevenson was in the lineup yesterday. No Ty Steve. We had Ty France bats playing a week ago, July 28th, Tyler Stevenson, designated hitter. Nice. Didn't matter, lost it. July 21st, no Tyler Stevens. July 14th, Ty, St- Ty Steve DH. July 7th, no Ty Steve. J- June 30th, no Ty Steve. I think he was on the paternity list that year, so maybe that's a – That's excuse. around that, that time. J- June 23rd, Ty Steve caught. June 16th, no Ty Steve. June 9th, no Ty Steve. Three out of the nine times – Ty Steve played on a Sunday. And that's where I get ticked. I get it. Catchers cannot play every game this year. Right. But guess what? DH him. Right. DH the guy. You can't tell me that Ty Steve's so worn out from being a catcher that he can't go DH. The the Giants yesterday gave Patrick Bailey a day off. And guess what? Patrick Bailey was in the lineup. Yep. But yet we're going to (laughs) sit our second best hitter out of nine games. We're going to sit him six times, and we're going to go 0-9 in that stretch. Now, again, I'm not saying playing Sty Steve in those games makes you win those games. But it gets your second-best bat in the lineup. And, like, this is just the stuff that's starting to drive me crazy. Like, I don't I don't know. It's just like David Bell plays these matchups, and then yesterday you had you had matchups. Like, we're letting Ty France hit against the righty with the runner in scoring position. All, to, yeah. all David Bell does is play matchups. Why isn't he playing a matchup with the runner in scoring position? It, doesn't it just make doesn't sense. make sense. He picks and chooses. Like, if you're going to be a platoon guy, if you're going to play matchups, pl- be a platoon guy and play matchups. Right. I'll stand up for you Stick all day it. long and say, Stuart Fairchild hits lefties. Let him bat against lefties. Yep. But if you're, if you're, you can't pick and choose and say, oh, it no. works here. It doesn't work here. It doesn't work here. And the last thing I'll say before I get off this rant <laughs> is 
so everyone's like, well, you don't want to use them in the sixth because then you won't have anybody in the ninth. Well, guess what? Nine times out of 10, I'd rather Jake Fraley or Will Benson or whoever it may be bat against the middle reliever right. against your lights out closer. Because yeah. the closer usually is the best stuff on the team. You're right. most likely not going to score against them. And plus, when you're not guaranteeing you're ever going to have somebody on third base or second base again. Yeah. So just save him for the ninth to hit with nobody on base. Like, right. Those are the things that drive me nuts. You have certain amount of, you have a certain amount of opportunities in a game. Like yesterday, you had back-to-back innings with guys in scoring position and back-to-back times with less than two outs. David Bell did not pinch hit. And that's where I don't understand. Like you're t- saying these opportunities are basically less important than the opportunities we may or may not get later in the game. Right. That's the thing is like, but you know the the wait for the ninth argument. I hate. I can't stand when people say that because you take the opportunities when they're presented to you. That is the point of that strategy is to do it when they're presented to you. Obviously, you're not going to do it in like this second or third inning because the starter should be in that position. If they're if they get all starter and a reliever comes in, then you sub them. That's what you do. If the that in like you're saying like with the um, inconsistencies of it, then that strategy isn't ever going to work. How can you ever even know if it's going to work if you don't do the same, if you don't follow it? You know, I think like last year, for the most part, obviously I'm sure there were times, but for the most part, it seemed like he was following that where when a guy was horrible against lefties or righties, he would pinch hit for him or not play him that day. But it just kind of, and I know, certain things this year have played into it but if you're gonna be a platoon guy like i know you've said it but like it's true be the platoon guy be the guy that plays the numbers you can't do the in between it doesn't work like that and it's yeah and again pretty we're, obvious we're letting we're talking about letting luke mailey and ty france bat it's not matt right. mcclain up there on a right on right. right situation it's that's what, ty yeah. france and luke mailey like it's the perfect opportunity Literally, to platoon somebody. like all right, Luke Bailey's what sixth inning guy on third. Perfect. Literally, this is why we do this for this yeah. situation. And I will nope. say, I think Luke Bailey faced a lefty. So he okay. technically it was platoon because I think I screwed that up on Twitter. But still, you'd rather still. have Ty Steve in the game yeah. over Luke Bailey at that time. Like Ty Steve, if Ty is- Steve has to catch three innings, he's going to be okay. Yeah. It's not going to ruin sure his rest. probably day. be all about it. Yeah. And that's like, just. It's just and, crazy. And Ty Steve's having, you know, besides Ellie, and maybe even more than Ellie, I, you know, it's hard to compare to Ellie, but like from last year to this year, Ty Steve is having the best season on the Reds team besides Ellie, uh, hitting wise. For, yeah. Improvement. Like, I mean, the numbers are insane what he's improved upon defensively, too. That's a huge one from last year. He's so much better defensively. And I don't know. It, I'm with you. Like I was never real big on hating on David Bell and like, I'm, I'm a numbers guy too. I love the numbers. So I enjoyed playing the platoons and stuff, but it's really hard to back a guy when he doesn't do what he says he's going to do and makes decisions that don't make sense. Yeah. And all this is coming to a head because they're losing. Right. right? So yeah, when the Reds offense is terrible, you notice things like that, where if the Reds had five runs in the game, you would never question it. But when they're scoring two runs a game and the players aren't play- the players aren't delivering, you start yeah. realizing things like that. And one last thing on the David Bell discussion yeah. that drove me crazy is last week, again, I think I was halfway paying attention to the game because I was on a work trip in Chicago. The Rays came out and said, Hey, we're going to uh we're gonna pitch this lefty as the major- we're going to start this righty and we're going to we're going to pinch this lefty the majority of the innings what's david bell do he pl- he puts all the lefty smashers in the lineup which first of all again maybe you don't want to burn guys this early but if you're going to start the righty why don't you load it with lefties to start off with but no since because he's only going to pitch one or two innings we put all the lefty smashers in there Stewart, santiago ty france i don't even know if ty france was on the team at that point maybe he was anyway we put all the lefty smashers in there. Well, what's the Rays manager do? He sees he sees this report and is like, ha, David Bell, what a sucker. <laughs> he doesn't even pitch the guy, I don't think. Maybe he pitched nope. late in the game. I don't think David he pitched Bell, at all. 
So now we're stuck with Stuart Fairchild. We're just stuck with all the lefty guys who don't hit righties, just facing righty after righty after righty. And you're in there like David Bell got out coached. There's no other way around oh. it. There's oh, no yeah. other way around it. He got absolutely out coached. He fell for a report, which you can say what you say. I'm sure the Rays manager told the reporter, this is what we're going to do. Right. But guess what? He didn't do it that way. And David Bell was absolutely outmatched. And again, I'm not trying to say that happens 10 times a game where your record's going to be that much better. But right. when things keep happening and the, the Reds are as bad as they are, every game counts. And these things are the kind of things that are just, you're starting to, you're, I'm starting to see them and they're starting to bother me. Like there's just no, I just don't understand how you just keep letting Stuart Fairchild face righties all game when That's you have Will Benson and Jake Fraley, whoever right. else on the bench, ready to go. And like the thing with the Rays thing is he didn't adjust to it. Even after they didn't throw the lefty out there, he just kept them out there. It's like, He's begging Coach the Rays. Him. Yeah, he's begging the Rays to be like, hey, we're actually not going to bring this guy in. And guess what? They didn't yeah. bring him in. Right. They like, didn't bring him in. He tried to call their bluff and they didn't bluff. <laughs> they bluff. Like, yeah. It's just absurd, man. It it's is. just absurd. And it's again, I truly, I truly it wouldn't even like I'm not to the point where I would be mad if they didn't fire David Bell. I'm really not. Like I I'm not fully like I'm probably leaning that way, but I don't ultimately also think that a new a different manager would have the Reds in the playoffs right now. I I still right. do think I still do think that comes down to players performing better and this team just hasn't been good enough offensively. But I understand where people are coming from and with the oh, Reds yeah. losing so many close games and you seeing a lot of like simple errors and errors in the field and base running mistakes like it does make you question things more and you're just wanting to be, you're just beginning to wonder is like is his presence and his you know, the way he leads is, is it, is it wearing thin? Like if guys, has it, have guys had enough of it? I don't know. That's hard to say. I'm not in the, I'm not in the dugout. I don't know if that's the truth or not, uh, but you're just starting to wonder of maybe, you know, maybe it is, what? maybe it's not. This is year five, four, five? I think five, I believe five. Yeah, year five. So it's like, and they made the playoffs one time, you know, yeah. I, it's hard to like, in sports, ultimately, it comes down it, the person who's going to get the can is the manager. You know, if it, the GM and the manager are the guys who are going to own up to a team's success or failures, and I think it probably is about time they, they do something about that. You know, they change GMs, but now the man. I think it's probably time to start questioning it a bit more. Yeah, and one thing I'll say on that before we before we wrap up the bell conversation is excuse me, just to play devil's advocate a little bit on that is like the the Reds teams under him have not been good. Mostly. I think right. what I think Nick Kirby said this um, on chatterbox sports, but he said one time under the David Bell era, they've been predicted to have a winning record above 500. Yeah. So you take that for what you will and you say, okay, he hasn't had the greatest rosters, but right. what I'll say differing from that. And last year you could give him credit. He had a great year with the oh, roster yeah. that was supposed to be bad. But there's also – you could find plenty of teams over a five-year stretch that were picked to have under 500 records and they went on to win 100 games. Now, are you going to give the credit all to the managers in that? No, probably not. But um, there are teams that overachieve, and maybe it is because the ma manager, maybe it isn't. But it's just – again, I just want to throw that out there just because yeah, I don't, it's not like the Reds roster has been good. Like people that just right. say David Bell's record as manager is awful. Well, yeah, right. he had some terrible rosters. Like oh, the yeah. after the Moustakis and Castellanos deals like went up and everything, like it was they were put in a bad spot. The Reds had no farm yeah. system, and it, they're trying to build it all back up. But yeah, it's just an interesting conversation. I know the fans are all on fire, David Bell, because he's the easiest scapegoat, and I'm probably right. leading that way if I'm just being honest. But yep. I I get both sides. Like it, it's not all the manager's fault, and it comes down Same. to players making plays. Same, but I think you know my. I'm I'm with you. I'm not sure. I think I probably am getting to the point of wanting to fire David Bell mostly just because I think it sometimes you just need to change. It might not even be that the guy is that bad or anything. It's just clearly they're not succeeding under him right now. Um but I do agree with you that like it's not just the coach. I mean literally when people, you know, last year is the perfect example of it of comparing to this year is 
it's not just the coach that matters. It's mostly the players, you know, their performance. But then you look at like the Diamondbacks last year. I have no idea, but I can't imagine they were predicted to go to the World Series. Exactly. Let alone, I mean, you know, and obviously they're a great team, but that definitely had something to do with the manager last year. So it's, I think that's hard to, it, it, it's hard to differentiate what is. More yeah. You'll never actually know. You'll have, never actually know what played the key role. It's a mix of everything. Right. And it's easy to, if you want to blame somebody, you can just blame somebody. If you want to say, yeah. no, it was because all this, you can you, there's never an actual, right. The Diamondbacks went to the world series because the manager of the Diamondbacks went to the, yeah. because the manager sucks, whatever it may be. But yeah. yeah, it's an interesting conversation. We'll see what the Reds do. I don't think they'll fire them under this um, ownership, uh, but it's interesting. We'll I, and we're wearing thin. We'll see. But all right, moving on. We got a couple more topics. Noel V. Marte, we talked about the Reds' offensive struggles. Um, again, Noel V. Marte is 22 years old. He came up last year, um, and I think he hit like 316 in, I don't know, 50 games or so. Uh, probably came up sooner than anyone thought he would come up. Um, yeah. This year, he gets suspended in the offseason um, and for PEDs and comes back and really struggles in minor leagues. He's really struggled. Um, in the major leagues i'm to the point i know people want him sent down maybe you send down just to get him confidence um i i don't think i'd hate it i i do like seeing him play i i'm huge on noelvi Marte. i think he's still going to be a good big leader or big leaguer i do think and i'm not i'm not a hitting coach by any means so if you'd want to maybe i'm just spewing um bs here but like you watch him and the fact that i can tell that he's doing something wrong worries me um, yeah he starts open and he ends yep. open Yep. He can't get to the outside pitch. He's not hitting anything opposite field. He's pulling across everything, and that worries me. Um, with that being said, it's hard to adjust. It's hard to make adjustments when you're playing baseball every day. Right. Um, you and I both know we're big golfers. Like If you go out on the golf course and you're on the range and you're like, oh, I'm going to try this on the course, it's going to be a disaster yeah. because you're thinking you're not just playing – you're not. So I think it's probably an off season, like, Hey, we need to, we need to fix some things. Um, I just want to see him the rest of the season. I just want to see him get hot and just show some positive signs. He showed yeah. some positive signs defensively. Um, he was really bad there for a while, yeah, uh, he, but it he seems to calm that down a little bit. Yeah. He seemed to be getting confidence. And I think it's a confidence thing with him. Like, again, I think with a guy that talented, I think you can get away with things in the minor leagues that you can't get away oh, with yeah. in the majors. I mean, you see it with Ellie. Ellie's had that huge leg kick last year and mm -hmm. he's a big, long, loopy swing, but that only works for so long before major league pitchers understand where your weakness is. And pitchers are just throwing slider down the way, down the way, down the way, change up, change up, change up. And then giving no Elvi Marte nothing to hit. And he's, he's, I think he's pressing and swinging at everything. Oh yeah. And, he can't get to the outside pitch and he's not trying to drive the ball the other way and he's just struggling. But again, I'll say that I'll end with this before I get to your thoughts on Marte is he's 22 years old. I think, I think we saw what he can be last year. I think he's only going to get better. It was a tough off season for him. He dealt with, he got injured in the Dominican winter league followed by getting suspended for PEDs. The fact that he's only 22 and it'll be 23 next year. Go get an off. Go get a good off season. Try to figure out some fixes in your swing. Um, again, I'd just be happy with him just showing some bright spots. Um, yeah. The rest of the season, I don't know if you put Espinal at third base every day. Yeah, Espinal has been a little hotter. Um, but then, what, what are you filling out? Who are you filling out the other spots with? I don't know. It might be a little bit better, I guess, offensively. But at this rate, again, you can probably tell from my attitude. It's the Reds. If even if the Reds sweep the Marlins, like they have a lot of work to do. Um, and I don't necessarily think the Reds are going to go sweep the Marlins. Um, they just, you just don't know what to expect with this team. So um, that's my thoughts on Marte. What what kind of are your thoughts? Yeah, I'm with you. I think, um, you know, part of me says don't send him down just because I'm with you on the Reds outlook for the rest of the season. So I think just let him go and have as many at bats for the rest of this season in the majors. And then I think the biggest thing is let him have a good full off season where he doesn't have all the issues, you know, like you said, injury and PD use, and then go get some confidence into the next season, a regular off season going into a, his first full MLB season. And I, th I mean, I'm 
I'm still huge on Marte. I think he's going to be a great player. And I mean, how can you not? He's 22 years old. He hit like 300 last year for him in the game when one he came up. So he just looks, I think the biggest thing hitting is like one, he, he's got some mechanic issues, but also he's pressing. I mean, it's so obvious that he, all he wants is to just get a hit so bad, but that's making him not get a hit. And I think it probably stems back to like being suspended. And Oh yeah. He, I think I agree. Just to jump in real quick, but I think he yeah. came in, he came in feeling so bad, like, okay, I'm back. Like now I'm going to yeah. make up for it and I'm going to put the world on my shoulders and this team needs offense and yep. done the opposite. Exactly. Right. And now it's like, Oh crap, I suck. And now I have to be good again. You know, it just all snowballed for him and you know, it sucks to see it, but like, but then what I was going to say about the minors is maybe you do send him down for 15 days or whatever the minimum is. Let him get some reps against guys that he can get away with certain things, you know, get like we've both said now it's all confidence for him. So at least it seems, you know, a lot of confidence. So let him hit some out of the park against some guy, you know? Yeah. But I'm not sure that works, but I, th- I can yeah, see it, both things. Yeah, it's all – it's all. it all depends on the person. I mean, like, I actually right. do love that, you know, I, I do love that the Reds sent Connor Phillips to the ACL Reds after he was mm-hmm. having, like, the worst year ever. Um, yeah. Just to go like reset your mind and like go work on things where you have no pressure in a non-game environment. Um, I do kind of wonder, I was like, what, what were the Reds working on with Noel V. Marte for the, at the ACL <laughs> for the six months that he wasn't playing Seriously, or three months that he wasn't playing. But again, it's easy. Like you're, you're facing guys that aren't even in low A. So right. you can, you can, you can have mechanical flaws and still you're not just crush, you know? Yeah. And you're not yeah. focusing and you're like, I'm going to, do what I've always done to get myself here. And yeah. um, sometimes you have to go through failure to, you know, make changes. So I think we're both high on Marte. Um, it's been bad. And unfortunately it's been bad for the Reds because they need him at this point, but it yeah. just is what it is. And um, hopefully he's, he shows some progress the rest of the year and he comes back ready to go next year. Yeah. All right, moving on. Got two more quick talk topics. Hunter Green um, is the first one. We just have to talk about Hunter Green. The guy hasn't allowed a run in like 21 straight inning, three straight starts. Um, he's been unbelievable. I mean, I think if you can say Ellie just because he's Ellie and the year Ellie's having in the second in his second major league season is unbelievable. Yeah. But I think Hunter Green's one of the coolest stories, and not just on the Reds, but in Major League Baseball. I mean, you have a guy for whatever reason is got he had the weight of his world or the weight of the world on his shoulders and the Reds fan base would just crush him and crush him and crush him. Cause he'd only throw five innings or six innings or it just nonsense and he'd strike out guys. And you don't, you need just to throw to contact more or whatever. And the dude is just putting it all together. I mean, he's thrown two straight starts of seven innings, no runs, or I think yeah. two out of three, the one he went last, last time out, he went six innings struck out like 11. Like it is so cool to see Hunter green, just go out there and dominate. And just yeah. he's pumped too. Like the emotion he's showing when he's coming off the mound. When I was at the Braves Reds game, and they went out and talked to him with two out in the seventh. Like that's that's the time David Bell pulls the pitcher all day, every day after he walks somebody. He Hunter Green had 110 pitches or something like that, and he left them in there. And Hunter Green gets the out and walks off fired up. Like Hunter, what Hunter Green has done is so awesome. And what people like forget, he's 24 years old. I know. <laughs> and the Reds paid it or paying him like $60 million. When Hunter Green was out there giving up three runs to start, people acted like he was getting paid $300 million. Worst <laughs> contract ever. Reds Facebook is so mad that he's good, but it's just, it's crazy. Like, it's just so cool. Hunter Green, what he's done this year has been unbelievable. Um, and it's, it's one of the coolest stories for me all season. Yeah. I think, honestly, what, if the Reds offense was even just average, I think Hunter Green would be a serious candidate for Cy Young this year. Cause he would have, uh, I mean, how many, run, how many starts? I don't, I have no idea, but how many starts where he got no run support whatsoever. And what like this, um, this stat I saw it on Twitter from stat head. So, Two pitchers have ever had a five game span in a single season where they've pitched 30 innings, 40 strikeouts, 
10 hits allowed or fewer or two runs or less five games, five game span. Blake Snell in his last five games, Hunter Green in his last five games. That's the list ever. Yeah, that's incredible. You know, so that just those five games is insane. He's done it all year, you know, and like you said, you know, he was the Reds when the Reds drafted him. He was huge. It was a huge draft pick. We, you know, and he was coming up, he was doing well, and he had the weight of the world on his shoulders as far as on the Reds. cover of Sports Illustrated as a high school. Yeah, schooler, he was on the cover yeah. of Sports Illustrated. Yeah. So, and when he came up, I think you and I are on the same page. I didn't think he struggled. Was he what everyone expected? Maybe not, but he was still good earlier in the year when he last year, earlier this year, he was pitching six innings, giving up three runs. Well, that's pretty good, except he's doing better. It's insane. It's cool. Um, And like you said, like, I think this year, especially Hunter's attitude and his showing, he's shown a little bit more of his emotions this year, as far as excitement and um, just getting more into it, I feel like. And obviously that comes with doing well, but it's really cool to see him feeling that way. Um, Especially, I mean, he's dominating, so I don't know. I love it too. I'm, I love Hunter Green. He's great. Yeah, really cool story. Um, all right, last topic, and then we'll get off here. Um, just want to just a kind of overall discussion. Um, obviously, a disappointing year this year so far. Unless the Reds make a crazy run, they're probably going to miss the playoffs again. Um, haven't won a playoff series since 1995. Haven't scored a run in a playoff game since 2012. Um, it goes on and on. I mean, it's crazy to think about how you and I is, have grown up with just the Reds literally winning nothing. Um, and here we are somehow still diehard Reds fans. Um, <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, you, it's funny because like, I, I think from having somewhat of a following on Twitter has made me become more patient than I used to be just because I see the crazy stuff that people say. And I try to have a big picture outlook of like, okay. Um, like Nick crawl and company basically said during this rebuild, like, Hey, the, the last rebuild was a disaster. We're going to tear it down and we're going to do it right this time. That was two years ago. The reds overachieved so much last year. Oh my God. It got our expectations <laughs> for this year. So high And Vegas didn't even have the reds predicted to have a winning record this year. And that's with everybody mm-hmm. healthy. So you take that and you try to say, okay, it makes it like they're still growing. It's still there. The young core is there. You have Marte, you have McLean, you have CES, you have, now you don't know what you have some of those guys because they've been hurt all year. Um, right. You have Ellie to build on. You have a great rotation. I think the core is still there, but I, I, I understand why people are losing patience and I'm starting to lose patience Yeah, because we haven't had it for so long. If you're 50, 60 years old and you had the big red machine, well, guess what? We didn't have that. We literally had nothing. We had 2012 where we celebrated losing to the Giants in the first round like it was awesome. We got we got 2010 where we went to the playoffs and Roy Holiday threw a perfect game or no hitter, whatever the hell it was. We had 2020 or COVID year or whatever when we made the playoffs and we didn't score a freaking run against the Braves in two games. Like, it's crazy. It really is to th- crazy to it think is. about it. So just, I wanted to get some thoughts. Those are kind of my thoughts on, I, I do think the young core is there. I truly deep believe, but you do start to wonder um, the Marte struggling CES basically being out all season um, McLean being out all season. It, it, it makes you start to wonder of this core that you thought was going to be so good. It'd probably be like the Orioles or something. It starts to put some doubts in your mind of, Oh gosh, what, it, what if it fails again? And I think right. it's just a, what we've seen over the last however many years, you just start to think negatively. Um, But I do think deep down, like if you ask me, do you still think the Reds have a good young core and can have a good year next year? I do think yes. I think you probably got to go find some outfield help, et cetera. Um, But I do think the young core is a core that you can build, build around. And I think most importantly, the starting pitching is a rotation you can build around. So um, just what are your thoughts on where the Reds stand and where you think they are? that's what I was going to say first was um, for me in baseball, pitching is probably one of the most important things and the pitching rotation is good. And there is that core there. So that makes me feel good. Um, But what you know, overachieving last year, having, you know, coming in this year was probably the most excited I've been going into a red season since probably 2012. 
um, at least as far as what to expect, you know? Um, and it just hasn't, I mean, they've pretty much sucked this year, but it, so that's really hard, you know, like I'm, but like what I, I saw on Twitter today, their expected record this year is 59 and 52. I actually meant to say that with David Bell, but, but th- their expected record is 59 and 52. Does that mean anything? Not really, but it kind of makes you think, okay, so they do have the numbers to put up that kind of a record. Can we build upon that? And I think for me, the young core is there, you know, will it alter? Sure. And it probably needs to, but I think that with guys like Ellie Hunter Green, Nick Lodolo, you know, McLean, when he comes back, hopefully I, like that, like you said, hopefully, but I think with those guys, you do have that young core there that you can build around. Um, and I'm definitely with you on, I think in the, in the winter, they have to do something about the outfield. Um, clearly, you know, there's nothing in triple a, um, up the pipe, at least short term as in the next couple of years coming as far as outfield help goes. So I think they do need to do something there. And I think they can, I mean, they have the ability to, they're going to lose some of the pitchers. So are you saying, um, are you saying Reese Hines will not come up and be the savior next year? He's not going to hit 60 bombs. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to think that. I would like. To I that. will. I will make that prediction that he won't. But it would be awesome if he did. I love it. Yeah, but um, I think that's. I think the next. I think the next step is honestly. Sorry to cut you off, but I no, think the next fine. step is like to go get like depth because when yeah. you lose Matt McLean, when you lose TJ Friedel, yep, that's when you don't have the depth. When Tyler Stevenson goes and now I know teams don't backup catchers are a terrible position. Like most back, most catchers don't hit, let alone backup catchers. But like when you lose these guys, it, you, they don't have the Reds didn't have the depth this year. They didn't have the guys ready to come up. Like last year when Kevin Newman was struggling and he couldn't hit right-handed pitching. Like we brought Ellie De La Cruz up. We brought CES up who could hit bombs. Like we brought Matt McLean up who was arguably our best player. Like this year, we tried to bring up Blake Dunn. Not he didn't. He wasn't very good. We tried to bring up Reese Hines. He had a, a year, the week of the century, um, and then started to struggle a little bit. We brought up Edwin Rios, who I think got one hit while he was up. Like the depth is just not there, and I think that's the missing piece because people don't want to hear the we got injured, we got injured. Well, guess what? Next year the Reds might get injured again. Are we just going to say, oh, again, tough luck, 2025, got injured again? Like nobody wants to hear that. So you have to get the depth of. And I know that takes time. It takes time to build the depth, but that's ultimately, I think, where the Reds team, this current Reds team lacks. And that and a combination of guys you relied on not playing to what you thought they would. That's what I was going to say about the depth piece, too. I agree with you 100%. They don't, they never had the depth going into the year. But on to, you know, on top of that, guys like Will Benson, who, they were expecting things out of this year did basically has done basically nothing. And, you know, I mean, Jake Fraley Fraley has three home runs. Yeah. Yeah. Fraley is like a shell of what he was last year, if that. And so when that happens, that's really hard. So that's, but that's what they, you know, I think that's where it comes down to, okay, do we make a move or is coaching at this point with that kind of situation? We, we put the money into these guys and that's where we were putting, placing our bets. Do we, what happened? Was it them or was it the coaching? And I think for me, it's probably them, the players this year um, on, as, as a whole, but, or at least those two specifically, but I think overall, I still, I know that come, you know, after the season come January when football season's winding down, I'm going to look at the Red Sea 2025 and I'm going to feel good because of who we have. That's also, I'm like you, I'm a pretty positive guy. So I'm usually going to have a positive outlook, but I think when the time comes January, February, I'm probably going to feel at least pretty, pretty decent about the Reds going into next year. Yeah, totally agree. Well, we'll have plenty of time to talk about the off season um, in the off season and I don't know. I guess for the rest of the year, we'll just root for the Reds to go on some crazy run. And if not that, I just want to see the young guys right, uh, show some positive signs. 
Um, I guess it's almost football season. I love college football. You love college football. Um, I'll still be locked into the Reds um, oh, yeah. as well. But um, anyway, good good stuff today. Good discussion. Yep. If you made it this far, uh, leave a comment, like, subscribe, do all that fun stuff. Um, we'll hope to see you next week. Um, next week will be episode 10. Again, appreciate it if you made this far. Appreciate it if you've watched it. Um, we'll see you. Hopefully the Reds beat the Marlins tonight. When you, By the time you watch this, the Reds game will be over. Um, so hopefully we're, you know, the Reds have won. Hopefully the Reds have scored 38 runs against the Marlins pitcher and not one. Um, we'll see you next and if week. If they do score 38 runs, hopefully they don't score zero tomorrow. That's right. We're getting no hit. So, uh, <laughs> Paul, thank you. Um, we'll see you guys next week. See ya.